Imagine a uh, cold winter morning in Russia. Iwan is just working in his office. He's a businessman, he's a salesman of sorts. He's a reseller, in fact. He buys products and he sells them. Actually, he sells intellectual property. Stuff he can copy, stuff he can copy legally, stuff he can steal and duplicate. And he notices that Vlad has turned from his customer into his competitor. Vlad has copied his product and is now selling it for half the price. So that's how the story starts. We can talk about uh, Collection 1 leaks. They've also been called uh, 10 billion leaks uh, because apparently there are 10 billion records. Well, spoiler alert, there are not. Um, but uh, in any case, um, let's start by taking a look at how passwords get leaked. Um, from uh, how I've seen you, the audience interacting with the previous speakers, I see that you're actually quite a um, well, well versed audience in IT. So uh, maybe you know this one already. Then we don't. So there's a user, right? And uh, maybe you, maybe your colleague, maybe your mom or your dad, right? Some some people who are not so well versed in IT. And there are websites, and users tend to register on those websites, right? They create accounts, they create profiles, uh, they set up a password. Right? Maybe it's one website, maybe it's a couple websites. Um, we also have hackers who tend to hack these websites, and this is the most likely scenario of how user passwords get stolen en masse. And if you look at uh, the average password being stolen. So it's actually not true that uh, hackers hack your smart devices, that they hack your computer, and that is how they extract the bulk of the passwords. The bulk of the passwords actually come from websites being hacked. And the websites get hacked a lot. <laughs> Some users tend to reuse their passwords. Right? This, uh, let's call him Joe here on, on your left. Um, he has registered in two websites with the same password. Hacker has only hacked one of those websites where the user registered. And now they have the password and the email address, which is the identifier used these days, mostly, for both the sites, just by hacking the one. Right, but what happens next, right? Uh, so hackers, some either skilled individuals or just some very lucky individuals who tend um, to be in the right place at the right time and hack the right system. Sometimes it does take skill, sometimes it's just pure, pure luck and having the um, just leak zero thing that you can use. What happens then? What do these hackers do with the data that they have? Well, unless it's an APT campaign or, or a governmental run campaign, um, these hackers don't usually hold on to that for long. They don't have a lot of use for that. Actually, the criminal world criminal world in, in, in computing um, is quite well structured. It is an enterprise, it is a system of enterprises, as I tried to illustrate by my story in the beginning. And what happens is these hackers sell the data um, to data brokers or data hoarders. There are two types of those. Um, and the money begins to be involved in this, in this, um, in this stage, and, and uh, it's of course in the opposite direction of the line, right? Um, so what do, what do the data brokers do? They resell it, right? We have the um, dark web, so basically um, I'm not talking about these gray forms that are available quite easily to um, hackers and researchers alike, but, but I'm talking about the dark web where only trusted uh, trusted individuals uh, interoperate, not to say that there aren't um, some researchers or government agencies in there. And on the dark web, then the sale happens, right? We have multiple buyers, they just, just pay a fraction um, of the price that the reseller paid, but they have many clients, so they make a lot of money, right? <laughs> so that's how, how it happens. Well, Sometimes it happens that some of the buyers aren't that honest, right? They're criminals after all, most of them. Uh, so they go back to the market with a cheaper price on that. 
And sometimes it happens that uh, some of them, for some reason, decide just to open it up and go to um, normal internet, go to you know the traditional web. Maybe maybe not uh, not so available as Collection One is. Right, everyone can download the Collection One with the passwords. Um, right now, I'm not sure about the legality of that in the UK, but uh, everyone everyone can do that easily. Um, Mostly, it's not it's not that open. It's in those semi-closed forms, but you can still you can still get them when they get published. So that's basically the um, the timeline of how password leaks happen, from user selecting the password to passwords getting leaked. Now, I want to talk about uh, the specific case and what happened in the specific case right here, this collection one. So this here is a profile of an individual named uh, Corpse um, on one of these uh, not dark web forums. As you can see, the profile has been banned um, already at this point. Um, he touts himself ethical hacker and coder. That's the guy who was the hoarder for, for Collection 1 and some other collections. Uh, that's the original, original hacker who collected these databases. He probably didn't hack any of them, or at least most of them, but he was the original collector. Right? And you can actually see uh, from your right here that um, he was banned on the 30th of January and he only registered on the 6th of January, also 2019, by the way. Um, so what happened? This is what happened. Um, he basically created a post of his own stuff on this semi semi closed forum saying here are my collections check them out um you can uh, you can get them from here right <coughs> then we also have this this uh, is by a different guy who goes by the title of samix there was a similar offering by a guy named uh, Clorox, but Samix was, was this uh, more more recognized one um you can see that the guy offers you can't really see the the price here is $45 for lifetime access with free updates. Um, for different uh, combinations of usernames and passwords, it even says here that the type is email colon password, which is totally not true. I spent many, many hours trying to format uh, most of these files to this alleged format, back to this format, and I still didn't succeed fully. Uh, but I got like 95% of, of the data reformatted correctly. Um, so that's just a nice advertisement. We see uh, some sizes here, 90 gigabytes for collection one, uh, half terabyte for collection two, and so on. Right? So, um, Sanix is the guy who stole from this other criminal um, corpse the collections. So he bought the collections and he, he was reselling them. Uh, the original creator was the one that was doing weekly updates and of course that was cut off. So the original creator noticed that promptly. Uh, we are talking, um, let me give you a timeline here. So um, collection one started existing allegedly um, at the second half of 2017. And now we're in January 2019 where Corpse notices this shit happening. And uh, what he does is simple. He just uh, posts the collections on this semi semi closed forum saying, you know, uh, there is a guy that's been uh, stealing my stuff so and making money off me. So here you go. Here's my stuff for free. Uh, that's, that's where you can have it. And it was done uh, mid, mid January, right? <laughs> so the latest data that we have in collection one and in other collections here is uh, actually beginning of this year, which is which is quite cool. For a researcher, we can look at some trends there. We can look at uh, how passwords change, right? What's uh, what's the most common password in 2018? Anyone know? Password, that was 2012. One, two, three, four, five, five, six. Password. One, two, three, four, five, six. I was going to say password. Yeah, yeah, password was 2012, around 2012. It is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 in 2018. So we'll see uh, what we have in beginning of 2009, uh, 2019 at the beginning of the presentation, at the end of the presentation here. Um, so, and then we have uh, other guys reposting stuff. So this guy here actually put everything in one, in one large file, all the collections where you can download them. <coughs> so, um, of course, uh, I decided to do some research. I downloaded uh, everything there, and I took a look at what we have there. So I downloaded all um, 
all the offerings, <coughs> right, around um, around a terabyte of, of, of compressed data, uh, a bit more even. So this is this is what we have inside, right? So uh, we have uh, lots of text files, but we also have some archives, which means there may be even more text files inside, right? For for ASCII text. We may we may see up to up to around fifty percent uh, compression ratio, right? Um, so, but but one thing is that you should keep in mind through this presentation and in the future when other people or media are going to talk about these leaks that happened at the beginning of two thousand nineteen is this: much of the stuff in there is duplicates, right? So the red part here in this graph uh, are files that already are in the gray part. Right, so that's by file count. So we have 24% duplicate files just downloading all that from the internet. Okay, let's extract them, right? Let's take a look what happens when we extract. And I only did one level extraction because after doing that, uh, I mean, even though we still have some compressed files, it's not a lot. It's not a lot of them. Uh, so we have mostly text, almost 95% text, and we have, we have some other formats as well. <laughs> Here, um, the situation is even worse. We have around 30% or one third duplicate files. So, um, again, the database is not clean at all. As I said already, it's not actually, it is mostly in user, um, user colon password format, but not fully, and it's a lot of duplicates in there. So, size wise, let's take a look at how much data we have there. So, we have collection one, which is um, compressed. To 37 gigabytes as it's being distributed. We have a uh, collection 2 to 5 and so called anti public database, which is 365 gigs. Then we have a uh, 12 billion special uh, file, which actually contains 12 billion records. Um, and it's uh, 90 gigabytes compressed, and it's quite, quite a clean one. It's just one large file. Uh, then we have a uh, leak called BigDB around 600 gigs. So um, all these leaks, uh, they happened uh, beginning of this year, right? We started with collection one and immediately, I think that was next day or the day after that, that I noticed that we have all these other um, data sources available. So total that's around one terabyte of data. But uh, when we do the extraction, just the first level extraction, what we get is additional terabyte of data. Um, so we're looking here at two terabytes of usernames, Passwords, um, some credit card numbers, uh, some names, surnames, um, just a bit of addresses, recovery questions, which is which is quite a cool cool stuff to research. Actually, I've never I've never researched uh, password recovery questions before. Um, it actually makes you think how people think. So, how do you process um, such large amounts of data? Many scholars today uh, look at different, uh, different, different cool big data tools that that do near disk speeds, right? What's the right solution? As a person who uses open source a lot, uh, the right solution is of course uh, GNU, Quartils, and uh, and similar tools, <laughs> which don't do near disk speed; they do disk speed. Uh, that's what they do. Processing text files is super easy and super fast, easy, right? So. Uh, the tools I used for this research is uh, fine, of course, uh, because the structure of the of the files was so complicated. I just wrote a small script where I specify some part of the path and it finds it for me. Um, cat grep, we see anyone anyone use grep here? Grep, no? nice, nice. Um, set, of course, and the progress. Anyone use progress? No, ah, uh, one. Okay, okay, I knew that. So that's good that you are uh, have used Linux or are Linux users, so you know grep, right? Uh, Progress is this great, relatively new tool um, in in um, GNU toolset, and this is what it does. So when you launch it, it looks for processes that have file descriptors open, looks at the files, and gives you progress of reading or writing those files, which means you don't have to wait without knowing how long you have to wait. It's really cool. You have like your stuff running, and in another terminal you run progress, and you see, you see this. So that's that's quite a cool tool when you when you you know limit on time. <coughs> okay, but what uh, what I'm looking at here today for this presentation is just collection one, just this uh, 90 gigabytes uncompressed data, not the two 
terabyte. Because processing that uh, still is still ongoing. If the server is still working on that. In collection one, in uh, the media, we can see different numbers. Um, these are numbers that I got, and they will fluctuate by a thousand, maybe more, uh, depending on how clean the data is, or, or how clean you make the data, right? So what I got is 2.8 billion records inside all the files in collection one. 2.8 separate records of um, mostly users and their passwords. Uh, speaking of users, what I got is around 900 million different unique um, usernames. So the previous number was total records, including non-unique. Splitting by usernames, what I have is around 9 million, uh, 900 million usernames. And around 20 million different passwords. Now, the fun part. Let's actually analyze that. Let's start with the usernames, which are mostly, of course, these days, email addresses. Not 100%, and even in collection one we see usernames that are actual usernames. But luckily for us, there's also a field for email address when the database is leaked fully. And uh, analyzing email addresses by TLD, this is the picture that we get. And uh, I did that in order to understand what is the source of the leaks, who collected it, and why. What we can see is that, of course, most records are collected for .com. It's just obvious .com is the most popular domain, the first, uh, the first TLD that we've had. And the second place is Russia, right? So apparently it's Russian hackers hacking Russians. Um, so that's the conclusion that I came to, right? Um, on the third class, we have two TLDs, which are those, .NET and .UK, uh, which is uh, interesting. I mean, I didn't, I didn't expect that. I, I had, hadn't finished this picture when, when applying to this conference, so that's, that's not why I came. But uh, we do see, we do see quite a lot. We also see, um, we also see France and uh, Germany in the top. So basically, it looks like they're mostly concentrating in Europe, but not not just Europe. Okay, um, let's split it a bit more rough. Let's split it by domains. Split it by domains, we see the popular email providers, Yahoo, Gmail, Hotmail. Then we see Mail.ru, which is indicative, of course, of uh, Russia being one of the main targets here. For this presentation here in UK, I also did some slides uh, just looking at UK data. So uh, for UK email addresses, this is what we see. We see Hotmail, Yahoo Live, uh, Tiscali, Blue Yonder, and uh, Gmail, and some others. Right, so that's for UK. Now, one interesting thing to look at in uh, leaks and in analyzing uh, rogue data is always governmental data. And of course, I did a split by governmental addresses. And I wanted to see what governmental emails, what governmental domains are we seeing? And these are the most popular domains uh, that belong to, to the government, right? We see some um, Australian ones. Uh, so the first two are educational ones, which means those are probably just uh, um, governments that have decided not to use .edu and instead use .gov for educational reasons, which means that students and pupils get those domains, which is, you know, and, and then they end up on, on this list like that, which is understandable. But we, we, we do see some interesting ones. Uh, Nets.gov, I think, was already mentioned in the press uh, in, in regards to this leak. We have DHS, of course, for, um, for, for, for the US. And one not making top 10 here, top 11, is, is actually IRS, the Internal Revenue Service of, of the United States of America. Now, zooming a bit back out, um, which governments are the least unsafe in this regard? Which governments do not train cyber hygiene properly to their employees and allow or do not punish people from using their governmental email addresses or registered to random sites? Well, here we are. The first one is US, of course. Uh, they get .gov because they are the ones who have the internet, kind of. Uh, then we have UK, then we have, um, you know, Austria, Brazil, and, and so on. 
Um, again, slide specifically for UK, just looking at GovUK domains. Uh, so the whole 360 degrees is all the gov.uk in collection one week. Um, you probably know better than I uh, what these are, but we have Kent, DWP, Essex, Cornwall, and and so on. And we have so the distribution here is 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 quite uh, quite normalized. So we actually uh, see that a lot of them are with the same weight that we don't see here in top ten. So top UK passwords, which is the so keeping in mind the collection one leak happened allegedly somewhere around 2017, um, you know, the collecting of the collection. Which is the top password for, for the UK? What do you think? Yeah. Liverpool123. What, what? Liverpool123. That, that is a relatively good password, because the top password is password, but with a large, with a capital letter P. Uh, so it's safer than just using the classical <laughs> password, just a bit. Just a bit. And uh, one-fourth of a percent is the prevalence of this password in the UK passwords, right? Passwords used by account holders whose email ends in .uk. Um, we also have a bunch of other passwords, of course, the, the classical one, one, two, three, four, five, six, and we have Liverpool, yeah. I, I mean, it's a city, right? Or, or, or what? It's a football team. Ah, football team, right, right, right. So that's why we have Liverpool. And uh, uh, 10th position, Charlie, also also not seen in the, in, in the global top 10. Now, recovery questions is interesting part, as I, as I already uh, mentioned. So, what do people actually type in their recovery questions? I remember when I create my accounts, they, um, back when I did create accounts, because I had my, most of my accounts for, for 10 years, um, they, they offered you a fixed list of questions you couldn't type your own. And those questions were so dumb, but I never knew what to, what to answer. So I always typed none. Don't hack my accounts. Um, <laughs> But uh, these days, many sites allow you, which is good, uh, to specify your own question. So, an extract of some Russian guys or girls registering their accounts and selecting their recovery questions and answers. So the first recovery question, who are you? That's what they typed, right? That's their recovery question. And the answer they selected is, it's me. <laughs> uh, then we have... Nil? It's a guy's name. And the answer is select, of course, is yes. Uh, we also have who am I? And obviously the answer is uh, Camel. Uh, also a guy's name. And uh, a bunch of these actually, um, it's a part of the low security site because uh, that, that I, this is one file. I, I pulled this from a specific a specific password dump. Uh, it was a bit larger than just passwords as you, as you imagine. So, um, it's part of the low security set because it allows you to do this, and most users did, did that. They just uh, typed in the same thing for the question and and the answer. So, um, now coming to, to the conclusion of this short talk, um, of course we have to talk about what to do in the future um, to, to avoid these things. Um, leaks are going to happen, sites are not perfect, zero days happen. Mm. Just uh, just this year, we already had a bunch of zero days. Um, Pound to own just just finished. We we've seen zero days in browsers, and zero days in cars. It's gonna it's gonna continue happening. So what we can do as users, easy. First point, of course, do not reuse your password. Do not reuse similar passwords to the ones that you use somewhere else. Right? Do not reuse the passwords that you use in 2017. Uh, obviously. Choose strong passwords. And um, at least in Latvia, which is where I come from, um, our, our government cert is not doing a very good job of teaching people what strong password is. Uh, so what they do, they, they just uh, tell you you should mutate some words. So you take dictionary word, you change the, some letters to some symbols and so on, which is of course a dumb idea. Um, the other extreme that I've seen uh, people teaching other people is that you should just mash your keyboard and that's that's your password. Um, we actually had um, had a router company that makes routers uh, from Latvia that did that for their uh, key. They hard the key that they use for encrypting stuff. Uh, some guy just mashed the password. I reversed uh, their firmware, got out got out that map on the keyboard. You can see two hands going down on the keyboard uh, when you do a heat map of, of, of that string. 
And that's how they encrypt all the passwords. Anyway, uh, that's also a bad idea. But not just because of matching, because it's hard to remember. And if it's short, it's relatively easy to crack. Uh, best strong password is a passphrase, meaning uh, it's a sentence. It's long and it's easy to remember. That's a strong password. But, of course, these days we have password managers. If you are kind of person that inclined to, to trust machines a bit more than me, uh, password managers are a great tool. You generate long, random string of characters, and, and it works. And it's, then it's super secure. But uh, I think among, among us we have not just users, we also have developers who are potential developers. So I want to talk to you. Um, I want to talk about a thing that some of you, I'm sure, are aware of, but some of you maybe are not, and that is salting, of course. When creating a system, you have to salt your passwords. And this is what it means, right? In the database, you hash your password, right? That's Jumbly adopts a one-way function, so you can't get back to the original one, but with new granted passwords, they can, system can check if it's the right password or not. If different users will choose the same password, the salt, uh, the hash will be the same, as you see on the left. Instead, for each user, and I, professionally, I sometimes, uh, quite often do, uh, security audits, including white box audits, and I've seen a bunch of systems where salt is hard-coded to the system. So, don't do that. Every time a user sets a password, create a new random salt, as seen in the blue part here uh, on your right, and then use that to hash the password. And the hash will be different, which means it will be harder for an attacker who gets a database to mass crack your user passwords. So, in conclusion, I want to emphasize once again what's been done a bit in the media, but I think not enough. The leaks that happened beginning of the year, including collection one and the other leaks, um, most of them are old. We see, and I see, updates up to January 2019, uh, but analyzing them, I'm not so sure that they are too real. I mean, that the date matches what that is. Maybe that's just some criminal doing business criminal style and, you know, Generating random password user lists and, and sending out these updates. That's, that's what I think. Um, but mostly, most, the bulk of that is quite old. I'm not talking super old, uh, not MySpace times, but it's, it's a couple years old. So if you do proper cyber hygiene and you change your password from time to time, uh, you should be okay. So, finally, I did um, I did analyze collection one for the presentation, but I also have started to analyze the whole two terabytes of data. And uh, I looked at passwords from January 2019. And the top password from January 2019 is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So we're back there. Um, which is kind of kind of unbelievable, I think. But uh, yeah, there we have it. Um, from the around 10 million passwords that were marked as update of January 2019, 0.32% were using this password. So there you have it. That's me. Um, if there are any questions, I'm happy to answer. Yeah. Uh, how long are all the passwords that have gotten that massive? Uh, like two terabytes. How long would it take to get all of them processed? Oh, well, that depends on your processing power. Um, this is this is not a my research is not a paid gig, um, so I don't. Uh, I'm not interested in spending twenty dollars per hour uh, for 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 um, Amazon GPU servers. Um, so for me, I'm looking. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at, uh, you know, I think probably um, end of March, beginning of April, when, when everything's done. Um, so with my resources, um, it's, it's less, than, less than a month. But once again, it's not, it's not, it not only depends on the money you want to invest, it also depends on the kind of research you want to do. If you just want to know the top password, um, with my resources, I think you can do that uh, in, in one day easily. Uh, well, maybe two days on, on, on the two terabytes of, of data. 
Yeah, but uh, do you use uh, GNU? Do you use open source tools, the stream tools? Those are super fast. Uh, I mean, those are disk speed. It doesn't matter if it's HDD or um, or SSD. It it runs super fast. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for having me. Yeah.